Welcome to B&H Videos. You may recognize Rudy from some exciting programs like uh, we do uh, uh, the uh, G10, G11 uh, talk you've given. Uh, we've done uh, B, uh, the histogram, the history of the histogram. And uh, today he's going to be talking about custom functions. And real quickly, I just want to bring up on custom functions. You know, one of the, if you're a fast shooter, someone who wants to get out there or make a great picture quickly, uh, setting up your camera with custom functions ahead of time is going to let you interact with the environment or your models much faster. So uh, these cameras are very complicated. They have, uh, they can really behave the way that you want them to behave. Rudy's going to be talking about how to set up that camera so that it really thinks uh, ex it does exactly what you want it to do when you needed to do it. Uh, Rudy also writes for the uh, the Canon Digital Learning Center, uh, the DLC website, which is actually an excellent website. You may want to take a look at. Uh, we have some cards on the back for that, and for on the internet, we'll provide a link for that. Uh, Rudy is uh, probably the guy. I think you know what I'd say. You're probably in the top five guys who know Canon in the world. I mean, you, you know these cameras backwards and forwards. Uh, he does trainings for all the other technical sales reps from Canon, and uh, Rudy is a font of information on the Canon system. So Rudy, thank you very much for coming, and uh, we look forward to this. David, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I want to extend my thanks to all of you folks for joining us today uh, at the onset of summer. Uh, it's a great time to be out shooting pictures, uh, and we really appreciate you folks coming in, taking time out of your days uh, to be with us. Uh, we're going to talk today about custom functions in Canon EOS cameras, uh, a broad, broad category, and we're going to try and kind of nail this down and give you some clarity of, you know, what some of these mean, how they can, in some cases, be useful to you, and just give you a good picture in your mind about what you can do with your cameras and where you can take your photography by having more control over what your camera is doing. Custom functions weren't always with us in interchangeable lens cameras. Uh, the first camera with any custom functions at all from any manufacturer was the Canon EOS 630 back in 1989. That launched the concept of being able to go into the camera and change things, change factory defaults to make the camera set up more the way you want to work it in general or for specific types of assignments. <coughs> and really what it's let people do is really take advantage of what electronic cameras are capable of because there are so many different things that you can now quickly access, quickly change, and we're going to show you some ways that you can actually add features to your camera that you might not even know are there with certain custom functions in certain of the camera models. So it's a great concept. It was a great concept back in 1989 and it's certainly been refined to the point that it's common today, not just in Canon, but it's been duplicated by you know, pretty much all of our competitors as well. <coughs> We're gonna look at basically three things today. What do the different custom functions do? How you can work with them? And then maybe most important, why would you wanna use one of them? There are gonna be some custom functions that you're just not gonna really have a use for, and that's fine, just like there's stations on the radio in your car that you probably never listen to. It's okay, no problem. Uh, but there may be some other functions that you're either peripherally aware of or that you're you know, somewhat aware of, but you don't have a really clear view of why you would use them. So hopefully we'll give you some information about that as well. Now, as much as I would like to, we're not going to be able to cover everything. We're not going to be able to go down the list of every function in every camera. Part of the reason is since we launched EOS digital SLRs, not film like I showed you a moment ago, but digital, by my count, there have been 25 different EOS digital SLR models since the D30, not 30D, but the D30 was introduced in 2000. So that's a lot of different cameras. And the custom functions, you know, have been added to and so on by our engineers over time. Uh, so if you're using a camera like a 20D and go to a 50D, you're going to see some differences on the 50D. It's going to have some additional things that the 20D back a few years ago did not. And then beyond that, there's just the different models we have in the lineup. You know, a camera like uh, a Rebel T1i, T2i has 13 different custom functions. A top-of-the-line camera like a 1D Mark IV has 62 of them. <laughs> so, again, I'm not going to be able to go down every custom function in every camera, but if you do have specific questions about a function that we don't touch on today, 
Feel free after the presentation to come up and I'll be glad to do what I can to answer your questions and give you some clarity about any specific ones that we may not have covered. What we are going to try to cover today are functions that are pretty much common among the different models. And beyond that, functions that are commonly used by many users. There's some that are a little obscure that in the interest of time we're just not going to be able to touch on. But again, if you have questions, come up to us after the fact. Toward the end of the presentation, we'll get into discussing some of the functions that are unique to a couple of our cameras. The EOS 7D, which really breaks some exciting new ground in certain areas. And then the EOS 1D series, our top of the line cameras, which as I just showed you a moment ago, really push the envelope in terms of the ability to let you customize the camera in different ways to make it tailored to the way you want to work. Starting with some of the basics on custom functions. If your camera has a mode dial that looks like that with a green zone, you can't use it for custom functions. If you want to start working with custom functions, you've got to be in one of the so-called creative zone modes. That means program, shutter priority, which is the TV setting. It doesn't mean television. It means time, value, or shutter priority in Canon language. Aperture priority or manual. End of story. Okay, you can't be in the portrait mode or the landscape mode or the green zone or whatever. Any custom functions you set in one of these modes, if you then were to turn the camera to the green zone or whatever, those functions are ignored. Over time, the menu on the back of the camera has changed slightly in appearance. So folks that are working with cameras that have been introduced in the last couple, three years, when you go into your custom functions, you're going to have a menu that looks something like what you see on the screen here. Now, if you have an older camera, like a 20D or a 10D or something like that, your menu may look a little different, but the basics are essentially the same. Let's go over the different parts of what the custom function menu is telling you, because there is some good information here to get you started on focusing on what these will do. First off, in the last few years, as the number of custom functions have grown in cameras, I just showed you how the 1D Mark IV has 62 of them, uh, the engineers realized that we're going to have to do more than just list them one through whatever. So what they've done is they've broken them into four different categories on the newer cameras, each category designated with a Roman numeral, Roman numeral 1, Roman numeral 2, and so on. And so you see on this one, Roman numeral 1, group 1, deals with exposure functions that deal with something to do with your exposure system. Under that is where the rubber meets the road. That's going to tell you what that function does. The name of that function and what it does. Sometimes it's real nice and crystal clear. Sometimes, to be perfectly blunt, it's a bad translation. And I understand how when it is sort of a wacky translation, it can kind of have you scratching your head saying, what in the heck does this do? And that's part of what we're going to talk about today with some of them, is to give you some clarity there. And then beneath that, you have, excuse me, before I jump there, within each group of custom functions, each function has an individual number. This one happens to be number 7 on an EOS 7D. Then, beneath that, you have your different choices. Option 0, you see the 0 there, is always the factory default. That's what the camera came out of the factory with when you took it out of the box. That's where it was set. You can freely set it anywhere else. No matter what you do with your custom functions, you can always return them back to zero. There's no way you're going to permanently change the camera or whatever if you start getting into the menu and messing around with your custom functions. Another thing to keep in mind is that one of the options you see there is going to appear in blue type. If it's in blue, it's telling you, hey, right this minute, that's what the camera is set to. Now, obviously, out of the box, when you buy the camera, it's going to be at option zero. But if you've gone in and changed this, one of these would be blue instead. But again, when you go into the menu and go into a particular custom function, whatever it's set on at that moment will be in blue. And then your other options will be numbered below it. Sometimes you just have one option, like an on and an off. So it'll be option zero, option one. In this case, there are two different options. Sometimes there are more, depending on the particular function in question. And in terms of the way they're numbered, now I want to say a word about the numbering first because I get this question all the time. Well, what number is that function on my camera? As I said, there have been 25 different EOS models, digital SLRs, since the launch of the first D30. I don't remember every custom function by number on every camera. So if you ask me what custom function is that on my camera, I'm probably not going to be able to tell you without looking it up. The key thing is being able to look at the name and being able to dig that information out. But 
you may be looking at a web forum or something like that and somebody says, you know, hey, they got the same camera you do and they say, hey, try this custom function. So when we number custom functions, what you're going to see is the group number, the function number, and then the option number. So this first one here would be function one, Roman numeral one, function seven, option zero, one, seven, one, one, seven, two. So if you want to, you know, send an email to your buddy and tell him, you know, tell him or her, hey, this is the hot setup, you know, try this custom function on, you know, your camera. We both use the same camera model. That's an easy way to tell them. I mentioned that they're broken up into groups now, and the first group deals with exposure. So let's go there. Let's look at some of the custom functions that are common among most of the cameras uh, that deal with exposure. Now, again, you may see functions here that aren't on your particular camera. Not to worry. Give you an idea of, you know, some of the things that, you know, if you were to step up to a higher end camera down the road, some of the things that you might be getting in addition to what you have now. But don't fret if we talk about something that isn't in your camera because it's unavoidable that we're going to touch on that at some point. One that you have under exposure is what's called ISO expansion. All digital cameras come with a range, factory set range of ISOs that you can set. It may be, one, on our cameras they all start at 100. And it may go 100 through 1600, 100 through 3200, whatever. There's a standard factory set range and you can set the camera anywhere, you know, within that range. This custom function lets you go beyond that range. You can get set higher ISOs. Depending on the camera, you can set them astronomically high in some cases for those times you want to. When you do that, the ISOs are labeled instead of like 3200, instead of like 6400, 12800 and so on as a number, you'll see H1, H2, H3. And that's a clear indication that you're in that expanded zone. Uh, I don't see any reason for most of us not to just set this function on and leave it on. Because you can always use the regular ISOs. You can always use 100 or 200 if that's what you want to do. All this does is open the door so that if you want to set higher ISOs, you can. And that's what the custom function box would look like. If you set it on, it allows you to go higher on the ISO range when you want. And some of the cameras, like the 5D Mark II, the 1D series, will let you go from 100 down to ISO 50 on the low end as well. And that will be indicated by a letter L when you're actually setting the ISO. A couple of quick examples of what this can do for you in real life. I'll show you some shots taken with a 1D Mark IV, uh, which has the broadest ISO range of any of our current cameras. Here's a shot taken at ISO 25,600. There's some noise there, but I mean, if you look at the actual file, there's actually a lot of detail in this file as well. It's pretty sharp. Here's a shot taken at ISO 51,200. That was lit by a cell phone that the young lady was holding. That's at a tenth of a second at f4.5. Now, there's no question, there's some noise in this picture. Nobody's going to get around that. I mean, there's some noise in this frame. This is, uh, keep in mind, this is no noise ninja or any other noise reduction, you know, processes applied in the computer after the fact. So this is pretty much a straight shot. Um, some people will say, oh, well, I, you know, that, that noise is unacceptable. I'd never shoot at an ISO above 400 or something. Great. Do the math. At ISO 400, that would be equivalent to a 13-second exposure. And I don't think she would hold still for that long. And then this is, this is more for fun than anything else, but you can see an example here. This is a totally darkened room with the 1D Mark IV at ISO 102,400. The only light in that room, a colleague of mine shot this picture, the only light you, in this room is because there was a crack under the door with a little bit of light coming under the crack. Otherwise, this was a totally darkened room. Now, here's the same scene that's lit by an Apple iPhone. So, sure, it's noisy, but this is a capability that opens up some doors that, you know, you may not have had before. And, that, you know, in the past we couldn't even think of doing. You, imagine doing something like that with film. I mean, it just was unthinkable. Auto exposure bracketing has a couple of entries in our custom function menu. One of them is we can change the sequence of bracketed shots. Most of the cameras take three, when you activate your auto bracketing, the cameras will take three shots. And by default, it starts off with a normal exposure, then under, and then over. The reason it starts off at normal is so that if you're doing anything that's time or, if you will, moment sensitive, that the first shot, the normal one, is the one the engineers are guessing is probably going to come out right more often than not. That's the way the camera's going to work out of the box. But you can change that. And the, one of the reasons you may want to change it is a lot of times we're going to be either looking at our images or more importantly showing them to people 
in some kind of a browser form where they're looking at more than one image at a time. And if you see bracketed images in a sequence where the bracket changes from under normal over, it looks a little more natural than kind of starting normal, then under, then over, where it seems to kind of be bouncing around a little bit. So it's a judgment call. You know, you be the judge, but that's the purpose of this changing the auto bracketing sequence. Auto bracketing normally does not cancel itself. There's one way you can cancel auto bracketing without going in and literally turning it back to zero, and that's to turn the camera off. Usually that's sufficient, but we have some photographers who are in situations where they want to keep their auto bracketing on, like maybe not permanently, but long term. Even if they turn the camera off to go get a Coke and a sandwich, they want to be able to turn the camera back on and have their bracketing still in place, not cleared. So we do have a custom function for that. And that's called auto, it's called bracketing auto cancel. And basically if you turn it off, your bracketing is going to remain active even if you turn the camera off or if you take the battery out of it or whatever. The only exception is if you go into the menu and clear camera settings in the menu. If you do that, then the bracketing goes. Safety shift, some of you have been at a, a presentation or two where I've mentioned this before. Safety shift is one of those things that is in there to kind of protect us from ourselves. Um, safety shift kicks in when you are working in shutter priority or in aperture priority mode. And you stop and think about, for instance, shutter priority. The way shutter priority works on any camera, you set a shutter speed, camera sets the lens opening, and it varies it automatically depending on the light. So let's say you, go, you like working in shutter priority. You go out on a nice day, you're shooting candid pictures outside on, in the sun, and you're working at a fairly fast shutter speed like a thousandth of a second. Everything's hunky-dory. You're great. Okay? Then you go indoors. And in your excitement in terms of what you see, you start snapping away, and you forget to change the shutter speed and lower it. What's going to happen? Obviously, you're going to get pictures that are like way underexposed because the camera's going to try to shoot at a thousandth of a second with the lens wide open, and it's not going to be anywhere near enough light. Safety shift is going to step in when you fail to make those changes and make them for you. If you're in shutter priority, if it needs to, it'll change the shutter speed to give you a proper exposure. If you're in aperture priority, if it needs to, it'll change the aperture. So in a case like this, it might lower it down to like a 30th of a second. Now, as soon as you go back outside, your thousandth of a second would return to you. Yes? In shutter priority, doesn't the camera automatically change the ISO? No. Nope. If, if you have auto ISO set, but not if you have set the ISO yourself. If you've got a manually set ISO like 100 or 1600 or whatever, it's not going to change the ISO for you. Come again? There's no limit to the number of stops the camera will automatically adjust safety shift? The question was, is there any limit to the number of sh steps that it'll adjust? No, it'll go to full range if it needs to. If you set it at a thousandth of a second and you're in a totally darkened room, it'll give you up to 30 full seconds, which is the longest time speed it can do. So essentially, I'm going back to programming. In essence, yeah. But that's what safety shift is about. If you don't want it to do that, don't use it. But if you're thinking, you know, hey, I, I sometimes forget to change things and I shoot quickly, and uh, you shoot things that maybe can't be duplicated, yeah, you may want to consider it. This is when we get a lot of questions about it. Under the exposure, bra under the exposure category, uh, we have our custom functions for flash operation as well. If you like to work with flash in aperture priority mode, with any EOS camera out of the box, the camera is going to work as a, in slow sync when you're in aperture priority. So in other words, you get into an indoor situation, dim lighting, you set your aperture, f8 or whatever, the camera's going to pick whatever shutter speed it thinks it needs to to properly expose the ambient light in the scene. And that may be a very slow speed. I'm sure most of you have experienced that at some point or other. The good news is that can give you a very natural looking picture. That's a flash picture. But because it picked a slow sync speed, it filled in the background and give you a very natural looking picture that if I told you that wasn't a flash picture, you'd probably at first glance think, oh, okay, fine, nice available light picture. However, there are going to be times where you may want to work in aperture priority and you may want relatively fast shutter speeds. Normally when we work at conventional higher sync speeds, 125th of a second, or 250th of a second, whatever, we're going to get dark backgrounds when we're shooting indoors. But sometimes that can be a benefit. It may not be the most pretty thing in the world, but there are times you just want a good sharp picture of moving subjects. And in that case, a fast shutter speed is your ticket. 
So what this custom function lets you do, if you like to work in aperture priority, you can still set your own aperture, but now you can either tell the camera, hey, as soon as the ready light comes on on the flash, just lock our shutter speed at whatever our maximum sync is, in this case a 250th. Or you can tell it, hey, vary the shutter speed based on how much light is in the scene, but don't let it drop below a 60th. And just keep one little thing in mind, on most of the cameras, if you activate either one of these options, you can't work with high speed sync. If you set high speed sync on the speed light, it's not going to work. Some of the cameras have a custom function called flash firing. Enable, disable. Now you may look at that and say, why on earth would you like want to have a flash on the camera and not have it fire? The purpose of the disable is number one, to keep you from firing it accidentally, I suppose, but the main purpose is to allow you to put a speed light on the camera and use its AF assist beam for available light shots. Imagine a wedding photographer working in a dimly lit church, for instance, uh, where you could use the AF assist beam to get more consistent focus on subjects that don't have a lot of light, but the flash won't fire. You're working available light. So that's the purpose of that. Here's one for flash that confuses a lot of people. You look on your custom function menu, you start going down exposure, and you'll see one that says ETTL flash metering or ETTL metering, words to that effect. And basically what you're doing here is telling the camera how you want it to meter ETTL flash. It's going to help to quickly understand how the camera thinks. Because if you just look at the two options without understanding how it thinks, you're sort of left scratching your head saying, huh? Well, this is what's going on. Most of our cameras have a metering system that either breaks the image into 35 zones or 63 zones, depending on the camera model. The concept is the same, just the number of zones is finer, obviously, on the ones with 63. The same metering cell reads ambient and pre-flash illumination. So when you go to take a flash picture, a pre-flash fires first. All those zones are active, and they are looking to see what comes back, what is lit up by the flash. Those zones that get a reading back are the ones the camera will use when you're in evaluative flash metering. So the key thing is, it changes what it's metering, what it's concentrating on from shot to shot to shot. Those zones that give a kickback are what it's going to concentrate on, and it basically ignores all this stuff. It just says, well, not much going on here. That must be distant background or something. We just won't even think about it. Often, that can be real good because it lets the camera concentrate on a subject for flash exposure, even if it doesn't take up much of the scene. But again, it changes on the fly for each and every shot you take. That's a value of ETTL metering. The catch is sometimes it's going to be a little too selective. And you can find that you get kind of, it's, it's hard to get consistency. The newer cameras are better. But you may still find if you're doing something like just candidates at a wedding reception or something that like, oh, occasionally I'm getting an underexposed shot because somebody's, you know, it's the bride in white and then I shoot a picture of, you know, the, the best man in his black tux and it's a little over and, and that kind of thing. So we give you the option under this custom function of switching to the so-called average setting. And what that does is it changes the way the camera reads flash. Now, instead of concentrating on just those areas that kick back light, it just looks, it takes a reading off of all 35 or 63 zones and it mathematically averages it out. So it tends to be a little less fussy. So if you find yourself in a flash situation and the exposures are kind of bouncing around and you know, it's, it's just what have you, has you scratching your head, consider trying this custom function. Yes? Nope. The question was, if you're looking through the viewfinder, is there any way to tell whether you're on the average setting or the evaluative setting? There isn't. You've got to just go to the custom function and look. And this has nothing to do with the metering mode that you're set to on top of the camera here. That's for ambient exposure only. It's got nothing to do with the way flash is read. <coughs> is this custom function active in all of the cameras across the line? I think so. Now, it did. It may not be on some of the older ones, but on all the current cameras. The question was, is it active on all the current cameras? And I believe it is. Even down to like the Rebel XSI, I believe it has that as well, if I'm not mistaken. Going into the next group of custom functions is under the heading of what they call image. Things you can do 
to change the way your images look, to tailor your images a little more to your own personal taste. Now understand, there are a lot of settings in the camera menus that also apply to this, things like picture style settings and other things. For our discussion today, we're going to limit it pretty much to what falls under the umbrella of custom functions. So this is not all inclusive in terms of things you can do to your images in camera, but it is going to touch on the, the, the common ones that fall under that custom function umbrella, as I said. One is long exposure noise reduction. You go thumbing through your custom functions and you'll see that. And basically what this is going to do is if you take a long exposure, it's got to be one second or longer, otherwise it's ignored. But you have the option of telling the camera, hey, do an, an, do an, an, an analysis and reduce the noise in this picture. And the longer your exposures are, the more effective this is. Somebody shooting exposures that are like one second, five seconds, you know, six seconds. If you, if you did a test with it on and off, you're probably not going to see a heck of a lot of difference with most of our cameras between them. But you start doing star trails for like, you know, 90 minutes or two hours in duration. And believe me, you'll see a big difference in terms of how much fixed pattern noise there is in the picture with the no long exposure noise reduction active versus turned off. Young lady has a question? Yeah, would you use that in a macro setting ever? If you were, the question was would you use it in a macro setting? Uh, if you were shooting long exposures in a macro setting, it might be helpful. You know, you can try it on and off and see if it matters to you. Again, it only, it only kicks in exposures one second or longer. And you basically have two choices or three choices. It used to be just on or off. And by default, it's turned off. You have to turn it on yourself. Newer cameras have two settings and two options. An auto option, which is you take that long exposure and the camera basically looks at the information on that file as the instant it's taken, right after it's taken, and it decides for itself, do we need to apply long exposure noise reduction or not? So sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. The on setting just means, hey, anytime you shoot a picture one second or longer in shutter time, it's going to apply long exposure noise reduction. Now you may be wondering, well, why wouldn't you just leave this on all the time? Why would it be off as a factory standard? The reason is, what it has to do in effect, you, let's just say you took a 30 second exposure. You take the 30 second exposure, the exposure ends. If you have noise reduction, long exposure noise reduction on, what it has to do is then take in effect another 30 second blank exposure to generate the stray noise. You're not going to hear the shutter open. What you are going to see is that the card busy light on the back of your camera, instead of going off after a second or so, just kind of keeps on blinking. And what it's doing is it's gathering information, building up that same exposure, and then it's going to look at the two, the real picture you took, the blank test shot, which never gets written to the card, that, you, that, it, that it generated, and where it sees similarities in processing before it writes it to the card, it'll remove them. So that's how it, it basically is generating duplicate noise to do that. And why would there be noise if it's a properly exposed, even a long exposure? Why would there be that much noise in the first place? It's just a character. The question was, why would there be noise in the first place? It's a characteristic of digital imaging sensors, given current technology. The longer the, the exposure is, the more fixed pattern noise tends to pick up. And I mean, it's just it's just a fact of life. It's just you'll you'll see it as you as your exposures get longer and longer. The catch is, like I say, your camera is going to be tied up for that same thirty seconds or whatever the length of time is. So you can't take another picture during that time. So if you're taking, you know, star trails for an hour, that means after your hour exposure, it's going to be busy for another hour. So that's why you have the option of turning it off. There's also high ISO noise reduction, which is a little more self-explanatory and a little more an everyday fact of life for people. And this is something that we've added to on recent cameras. Uh, for a while, our cameras just had on or off. Now, most of the current, not most, all the current cameras give you a choice of three settings in addition to off. Here's an example taken with a 1D Mark IV. We look at that one little area at ISO 6400. If we shoot with noise reduction off, there's obviously a pretty fair amount of noise there. At 6400 ISO, it's unavoidable. The low setting starts to clean up some of the chromatic noise, which is that kind of pastel colored salt and pepper noise that's in the picture. The luminance noise, which is the gray and kind of dark gray and black noise, is still basically present. 
when you do the low setting. If we go to standard, which is the factory default, this is what your camera is set to when you take it out of the box. Oops, I'm sorry. The standard setting starts to attack some of that luminance noise, some of that black and white, and again, I'll use the phrase salt and pepper noise. Uh, and this is probably a decent place for most of you to be. There is also a strong setting, which cuts the noise even further. Now, you may be wondering, well, I don't want noise in my pictures. Why wouldn't I just leave it on strong all the time? Try it and see how it works for you. The catch is, the more aggressive noise reduction has to be, the more detail it's going to tend to take out of the picture. So you got it's a it's a bit of a tightrope. You got to sort of weigh and assess for yourself. And the results, the noise reduction is pretty smart on these cameras. It's going to behave differently at ISOs like 100 and 200 than it does at ISOs like 3200 and 6400. Okay, so it's a good thing to experiment with and just sort of see what settings tend to work best for you. Again, standard is the factory default. Yes. So when you have it on draw, is there some other function that it The question was, when you have it on strong, does it cancel out any other functions? No, it doesn't really cancel out any other functions. The only thing is, it is going to cut back how fast you can shoot as well, uh, and how many shots in a burst you can take. And what, what would that speed be? Like? Depends on the camera. The, the question was, what, what, what would that speed hit be? Depends on the camera. Most of the time, it's going to drop it down to like two frames a second or something, but it depends on the camera. Yes? Uh, that, the question was, does it work in, in video as well as in still shooting? And the high ISO noise reduction does work in video as well, as I recall. Yes? Does it apply to all ISOs? Yes. The question was, does it apply to all ISOs? Yes, even if you're at a low ISO. It's, like I said, it's, it, the, the power of the effect varies depending on the ISO you're at. But you can set high, high ISO noise reduction at ISO 100 if you want to. One more. You only have on and off. Uh, options. Mm -hmm. The on is the uh, standard. Yeah, the question was if you only if your camera only has on and off, is the on like standard? And yeah, effectively it is similar to standard. This is one of my favorites. And unfortunately, those of you looking at the screen here are not going to get the full impression of this because we're losing a little bit with the projector. But work with me on this. Go by where, where you're not seeing what I'm saying. Go by what I say, not what you see. Highlight Tone Priority is a very, very cool technology that you access in your custom functions. You can turn it on, you can turn it off. What it's going to do is add up to a stop of additional detail in bright highlights, but without changing the rest of your exposure. Anybody can tone down highlights by just darkening the whole exposure. There's times where that's appropriate. But there's other times where you're trying to open up to get some shadow detail or whatever, and you don't want to blow out the highlights, and you're really kind of walking a tightrope to kind of keep the two in balance, highlight tone priority in those situations is your friend. Here's an example. Again, it's, it looks on the screen here like this is just totally blown out. This actually is a pretty carefully metered exposure in the manual mode, so it's not going to change. And what we got here is an exposure that is just enough that this image has real detail. In fact, with highlight tone priority off, if we go around this image in Photoshop and look in Photoshop's info palette, we're going to see as far as RGB values that it's got about 252, 252, 252, give or take. It'll vary like, you know, by one or two ticks as we move around. And one of the most useful things in that info palette is the grayscale palette. It's a color image, but if you look at, if you set one of those palette information uh, panels for grayscale, you'll get a percentage of black. And it's telling us we got a percentage of black of about one or two. People who've been around the block with this know that that means there is detail in the file, but it's going to reproduce as like a paper-based white if you try to make a print out of this. There's just not enough in those white tones. Technically, there's something there, but we need more. If we simply turn highlight tone priority on, don't change the exposure at all. It's manual exposure, so there's no chance of automatic exposure tripping us up there or anything. And we take those same Photoshop readings. They go down to about 245 on the RGB scale, and on the K value scale, they go up as far as a percentage of black to about 5 or 7%. That means we got a white with texture and detail. Now, again, I know on the projector here, you're not really seeing it, but trust me, it's in the file. And this is an example looking at the histograms from those very two images in our digital photo professional software. The histogram with it off, you can see that there's a big, Highlight spike here that's just on the verge of touching the edge. Now look what happens with the same exposure. 
with highlight tone priority set. The whole highlight, the whole highlight area moved over towards the left. We moved it away. We got more detail there. Highlight tone priority. If you like working outside in sunlight or under harsh lighting conditions where you got a lot of bright highlights, highlight tone priority is a cool feature. It's not a magic wand, but it is a good feature, and I recommend you try it and see what kind of results you'll get out of it. There's another feature called the auto lighting optimizer under our image control. And auto lighting optimizer basically is going to do two things for you. Number one, it's basically what it is, is a tool that for somebody who is working, particularly if you're working a JPEG workflow, it'll work with raw images too if you process them in our software. But particularly for somebody who needs to work in a JPEG workflow, like a press photographer or something, Auto Lighting Optimizer basically starts to go in and do a little tone curve adjusting for you before you do anything in Photoshop. And for people who just don't have the luxury of time to do something in Photoshop, it can give you a better starting point sometimes. One is that it'll take a flat scene, it'll, it'll analyze every picture you take, and if it senses that the contrast is flat, it'll kick it up a little bit. Now the differences are subtle. Highlight, I mean rather, Auto Lighting Optimizer is not a night and day tool. The other thing it'll do is when it sees that you have shadow areas that are underexposed, it'll go in and try to bring the shadow detail up. Now again, on the newer cameras, you've got four different strengths, you can, three different strengths plus off you can call up. Uh, some of the earlier cameras with Auto Lighting Optimizer just had on or off. But here's an example. Same exposure. Again, anybody can change shadow detail by changing exposure, but if the exposure is the same, you can see that with the auto lighting optimizer set to strong, we're definitely getting more in the way of shadow detail and so on than we are with it turned off. Is it the right tool for everybody? No. There are some photographers who want to precisely control the exposure and precisely control what the contrast and so on is once they get an image into the computer. For those kind of people, it's not the right tool. Also, keep in mind that if you work in the manual exposure mode on the newer cameras like a 7D or a 1D Mark IV or whatever, uh, if you have auto lighting optimizer turned on, it can very well go in and it'll vary its effect from picture to picture. It's not going to always be the same because it analyzes every picture individually. And I've actually had, this is kind of funny actually in retrospect, I had a, a Sports Illustrated photographer shooting uh, pictures in spring training. They called me up in a panic saying, my shutter is going, or something like that. I just got a new 1D Mark IV. The shutter must be going, or something, because I shoot these pictures in manual mode, don't change the exposure, and the exposures are switching on me. They're lighter, they're darker. What's going on? I said, well, send me some files and we'll see. And we actually sent them to our service department, and they said, hey, you got the auto lighting optimizer on. And it's just, it's varying what it's doing, depending on a host of uh, little, you know, uh, uh, rules and regulations that it works by. Yes? Yes. Yeah. yeah. The gentleman's question was, was the uh, presence of it being on recorded in the metadata, in the text data that accompanies the picture, the picture info? And it was. Yes. Can you undo it in RAW? Uh, yeah. That's a good question. If you're working in RAW and you process it in Canon software, you can then go in and completely change it. If you set it on, you can turn it off. If you didn't have it on, you can activate it uh, when you process your RAW files if you use the Canon software. Most third-party software that's going to be ignored. Yes. It can. Auto lighting optimizer is going in and lightening shadows. The question was, can it can it increase noise? And yeah, anytime you start lightening shadows, pulling you know tone curves slightly, yeah, there's a risk that you can start increasing noise a little bit. Most of the time, probably not much of a factor, but it's just something to be aware of. Something. Uh, his question again was, does it work in video mode? And I believe it does. One more. Uh, the question was, is standard another word for automatic? No, I wouldn't say automatic. It just means that that's what the engineers consider the factory default. Yeah, it's, there's a low, high, and a middle, I guess. And the engineers consider standard like kind of a, a middle, one size fits most kind of setting. So that's what the auto lighting optimizer is about. You know, use it if you think it could be appropriate. If you're the type of person that likes to really, you know, get in and work with your images yourself, you may not really find much use for it. Autofocus. Got a lot of functions that deal with autofocus in your cameras. Again, depending on the camera, 
You may have some of these, you may have all of them. You know, it's, it varies depending on the camera. You may see one when you look under your group of autofocus custom functions called superimposed display. This is one of those ones that can have you sort of scratching your head saying, what in the heck do they mean by that? Basically, it's do you want the AF points to light up red in your viewfinder or not? So if your camera has superimposed display as one of the custom functions, it basically just means, hey, you want the points to light up red when they're being used? If you don't, if you find it distracting, you can turn it off. Firing an AF assist beam with your flash. Okay, and this is, it deals with focus. It's an AF assist beam, so it falls under the focus umbrella, if you will. Basically, what this is going to do is dictate, is your, when the camera needs it, if you're in one-shot autofocus, not servo, and you have a speed light on the camera, or if you're using a built-in flash, is the camera going to provide a focus assist beam when the focusing system needs it? Your choice. And basically, here's your, cho here's your choices on the newer cameras. Now, again, going back in time, some of the cameras may have had just had like on and off, but they've expanded that as time has moved on. Enable means that, hey, anytime the camera needs an assist beam and there's a flash on the camera or you're using the built-in flash, it's going to fire. Disable means you've said, hey, I don't want a focus assist beam. And you may not. Some people are concerned about it showing up in other people's pictures or distracting uh, a subject or something. If you're using the built-in flash, this is a factor to consider. Depending, you know, no matter which camera you're using, if you're using the built-in flash, the way the focus assist works in our system is, to be perfectly honest, it can be a little distracting to say the least. What happens is the flash is going to fire a series of extremely rapid pulses of light, almost like a continuous stream, that does give the camera light to focus by. So if you're in an extremely dark room, it may be the difference between letting it focus and not. But on the other hand, it makes it like impossible to be kind of candid and you know, unobtrusive as a photographer. And you may find that makes you crazy. So you can turn the AF assist beam off. Keeping in mind the way that built-in flash works, you can also say, hey, if I'm using an external flash, like a 580EX or something, which uses a near-infrared pattern beam, much less obtrusive, you can say, hey, go ahead and fire that for a focus assist, but don't use the built-in flash. And then finally, on the newest cameras, there's one that recognizes that the little Speedlight 270EX that we just came out with, I don't have a sample of it here, but uh, that also uses the repeating pulse of light like a built-in flash. So what you're saying here is, hey, if the flash has an infrared AF assist beam, fire it when needed. If it doesn't have an infrared assist beam like the 270EX, don't fire it. It's distracting. It bugs me. We've been talking about autofocus. One of the cool things that the cameras let you do, and this is where we start to get into operation of the camera that can make you a better photographer, is speeding up picking your, of your focusing points. Anybody who's heard me speak before probably remembers that I am a big proponent of using the focusing system that you have in the camera, using the technology and the features that are available to you. And a lot of times that means moving away from just the center focusing point. You know, if you're happy just using the center focusing point, hey, they're your pictures. You can do it the way you want. But it really can almost be liberating when you start working with the entire focusing point array, particularly in a camera like a 7D, which has 19 points, or a camera like a 1D series camera, which has 45 points. It can really be almost liberating to start working off center and being able to quickly compose and shoot in one motion. But part of the trick is getting to those points quickly when you need to. There are custom functions on most of our mid-range and high-end cameras that let you do this. There's one called multi-controller direct. And what that means is as long as you've got the camera active, in other words, you tap the shutter button so the camera's awake, all you have to do is go to that multi-controller and go up, down, side to side, diagonal or whatever, and you move the focusing points automatically. Not automatically, you're, you're, but you move them instantly is a better way to put it. And that's without pushing any other buttons beforehand. Or Some of the cameras have a feature called Quick Control Dial Direct, which lets you do the same thing with the Quick Control Dial on the back of the camera. Now, the beauty of that is that if you like shooting vertical pictures and you're holding the camera vertically, particularly if it's got a battery grip on it, what you're going to find is it becomes difficult to reach over to the multi-controller. You can do it, but it's kind of a stretch. Whereas the Quick Control Dial, you can do horizontally or vertically very easily with your thumb. So if you want to make instant changes to your focusing points, either of those options is a cool one to play with. And the, what I, one of the things I would suggest to anybody is 
Don't wait till you're shooting, you know, that, you know, your daughter's wedding or something to start trying this stuff out. Play with it at home. You know, you're sitting around, you know, sitting around the house watching, you know, reruns on TV or something like that. Just sit with the camera in your lap and just try a custom function that you haven't played with and just, you know, fool with it and see what happens. You may find some things there that all of a sudden it's like, hey, you know, this could be pretty cool in some situations. And remember what I said before, nobody uses all these functions all the time. There are going to be times you're going to turn one of them on and then another time you're going to say, ah, for this type of shooting, not the right thing, I'm going to turn it off. That's fine too. It's in the custom function menu. All of these are going to be, every custom function we're talking, the question was how do you activate this? All the custom functions we're talking about are going to be in the custom function menu. The beauty of that, like I say, is that you can go off center and very quickly tell the camera, hey, I want you to focus here. And you can do it, you can basically make the camera do your bidding. Now some folks would say, well, gee, why, you know, why not just lock, you know, use my center point, lock the focus, and then recompose. You can do that if you're taking one picture. But if you're taking more than one picture, number one, that means you've got to work to keep the focus locked. And number two, what if you change your composition? What if you zoom? What if the subject moves a little bit? What if she moves in closer to that person you, that she's photographing and you want to still keep on shooting? You've got to go back and refocus and everything. No, use one of the outer focusing points, put it right on the subject, bingo, you're good to go. If she moves or whatever, you're still ready to take another picture. These cameras have that custom function, or I should say those custom functions. So if you have one of these cameras, you've got the ability to be able to go in and either do multi-controller direct or quick control dial direct. Yes? Nope, we're going to talk about that separately. Question was, is that like back button autofocus? They are not. They are two sep totally separate things, and we'll talk about back button autofocus as a separate issue. This has to do with quickly navigating from one focusing point to another. Another thing you can do is change the size of a focusing point with some of our cameras. Now that's something that's restricted to our kind of upper end cameras, where you can take a manually selected focusing point and literally change the size of it. So if you own a Rebel or a 50D, unfortunately, you can't do that with those cameras. But there are some others that you can, and it's a pretty cool thing. I'll show you here on a 7D as an example. A single focusing point that you manually selected in the center would look something like this. You can go in and expand the size of that, and what you're doing is you're adding a series of points around it. You're still primarily working with the one point you selected, but the other points are available and on standby. If the point you picked doesn't see enough detail or it loses a subject or something, the system will instantly ask those surrounding points, hey, do you see the subject? And let it, give it an opportunity to gather information about your subject and keep focus on it. And that's particularly useful with moving subjects. And this applies whether your focusing point is in the middle or off to the sides. So in situations where you've got moving subject matter, particularly if parts of that subject don't have a lot of detail, it's a great backup to be able to change the size of your focusing point. Now with the 5D series cameras, the 5D Mark II and the previous 5D, you have the ability to do it as well to a limited extent. There's a couple of serious caveats. One is it only works with the center focusing point, not with any of the outer points. If you go into the menu and activate AF point expansion on a 5D, what it's going to do is it's going to call up six additional surrounding points in the center that are invisible. You don't see these in your viewfinder. The other thing is that they only work, even if you've set it on the menu, they only work when you're in servo, when you're tracking moving subjects. So if you're in one shot, even if you've set it to expand it, it's ignored. This, however, can be extremely useful when you are shooting moving subjects using the center focusing point because you're giving the system additional information so that again, if the center point, which is the primary one, just sees an area of plain, solid, you know, lack of texture on your subject or something, it'll instantly call up the surrounding points and say, hey, do we have detail here? And it can often mean the difference between a sequence of pictures where almost everything is sharp versus some where you got some soft frames thrown in. Normally, I am not a proponent of using servo autofocus for stationary subjects. But with the 5D, I'm willing to make an exception because of this. Because this will give you the opportunity, even with a stationary subject, to be able to focus quickly on things, whether you're shooting candid pictures of people or whatever, 
And even if that main focusing point doesn't see enough detail, if you're picking up, you know, the tech, the, you know, the smooth area, somebody's cheek or something, uh, those surrounding points usually will grab onto something and let you get the picture quicker. When you manually pick a single focusing point, you've got the ability to expand it by picking one on either side. You can pick a ring of surrounding points. And with the 1D Mark IV, you can pick an even bigger cluster of points that, depending on where the point is you're initially working with, can add up to 18 surrounding points. So what you're going to see on the 1D series cameras, the Mark III's, the Mark IV's, and so on, is a menu that looks something like this. AF expansion with selected point. And disable means, again, no expansion. You're working with just one single point at a time. Left-right point means you're adding a point on either side. Surrounding AF points means you're adding that ring of six points around whatever point you've selected. And then on the Mark III camera, excuse me, the Mark IV camera, the newest one, is the option which is a little bit of a misnomer. They call it all 45 points area. As I said, it starts by adding a cluster of up to 18 points surrounding the point you've picked. The idea is that if the subject moves out of that cluster of 18, that the whole cluster will kind of move along with it around the whole autofocus ellipse area, around the whole 45 point area. As a practical matter, I found that it's real reluctant to get out of that initial cluster of 18 points. But within that cluster of 18 points, it will follow subjects moving around pretty well. So people that are shooting things like birds in flight or whatever may want to try that and see if that works for you in that kind of situation. Another custom function you see under autofocus is one called lens AF stop button. And what that refers to are the stop buttons on some of the select super telephoto lenses that we make. Any of these buttons, if you press them, they all do the same thing. There are four of them so that depending on how you're holding the lens, you have access to any one of them depending on just how you like to hold it. Basically, by default, they'll lock the focus if you push any of those buttons. So you can be in servo tracking a football player or something, and then if you just press one of those buttons, it'll lock the focus for you if you wanted to lock it. But you can change the function of those buttons to do a number of other things when you press them. You can have it start autofocus. You can have it start image stabilization. You can have it toggle back and forth between one shot and servo every time you press one of those buttons. So there's a number of different things you can tell the camera you want it to do. It can only do one at a time, and all the buttons are going to do the same thing. You can't say, okay, one button does this, one button does that. Unfortunately, you can't do that. These are the lenses that let you do that. Obviously, these are the high price spread, some of the big super telephoto lenses that we make, the so-called big white lenses. You can set this custom function on your camera if you're not using one of these lenses. If you do, it's just ignored. You're not going to hurt anything by doing it, but it's only going to have effect if you use a lens with those, AF, uh, with those AF stop buttons, they call them. This one always generates a whole lot of questions and controversy, and I want to kind of buzz through it quickly, but it, it is important to understand. First off, AF micro adjustment, you only have it if you have one of the cameras you see listed on the screen there. If you don't own one of those cameras, your camera doesn't have it. Still good to listen and get an idea of what it does and how it works. But like I say, if you own a 20D or something, don't go looking for it because it isn't there. What AF micro adjustment does is calls up a menu that lets you literally change the plane of sharpest focus. The purpose of this is if you find yourself in a situation either with one particular lens that you own or across the board with every lens you own, if you find yourself in a situation where on a consistent basis, I emphasize the word consistent, not just once in a while, but on a consistent basis, if you find the camera tends to focus behind or in front of your primary intended plane of focus, you've got a setup in the camera now, a system in the camera, to let you make an adjustment within a certain range, obviously, to bring that back to where it needs to be. Most of the time, you know, you take your center focusing point and put it right on my face or whatever, most of the time, properly working lens and camera, everything will be fine. You know, my face will be tack sharp, and if you look really close, you know, my ears will be a little soft and out of focus and so on. That's cool. That's where you want it to be. But if you find that on a consistent basis, you focus right on the nose or right on the lips, and, you know, hey, the ears are sharp all the time and the face is just a little off and it's consistent. This is, this is where you make your adjustments. Basically, what it's going to ask you to do is to take a series of test shots with the camera on a tripod 
lens wide open, aperture priority is ideal for that, but lens wide open aperture, and you want to focus on a discernible subject with detail using the center focusing point only. And basically, if you then look at those images, in, you know, magnify the images in a program like a Photoshop or something where you can, something where you can enlarge your view. Here we focus with the center point and you can see with everything set to normal on a properly working camera, the sharpest plane of focus went right down the middle of the letter R on the February on this calendar. That's just about where it should be, no surprises. What the, micro what the AF micro adjustment lets you do is push the focus back toward the camera. In this case you can see with it set to minus 20 all the way to the extreme of minus. What it's doing is it's putting the sharpest plane of focus instead of in the letter R, it's putting it in the letter U. And if we go to plus 20, move it away, say, hey, put the sharpest plane of focus more distant. It's putting the sharpest plane of focus at about the letter B, on the left side of the letter B. So what we're doing is we're just telling the camera, it doesn't do anything to the lens. It just tells the camera, hey, whatever you think is the proper plane of focus, shift it forward or backward. The way you'd work it is, do a series of tests, probably a plus or minus 20, plus or minus 10, and then start looking at your images. And just like when you, you know, for those old folks like me that are wearing glasses, you go to the eye doctor and they have you look in the machine and they put different lenses in and they say, okay, what's, what's, which one's better, which one's better, which one's better, which one's better. You want to just look at these and say, okay, which one looks like it's, you know, getting close. Then start messing around with a single individual, you know, plus 13, you know, minus 7, that kind of thing. Each tick mark, each, you know, plus one, plus two, is one eighth of the depth of field with the lens wide open. So you're dealing with really fine increments. Not something that I recommend most of you worry about. But if you do find consistently with either one particular lens or with all your lenses that you're having a problem, AF micro adjustment, if you own one of those cameras, is your ticket to avoiding a trip to the service department. Yes. Nope, you want to shoot at an angle. In other words, if I was... What angle? Now, there is no one set thing, but you want to be able to see a discernible front and back. So in other words, if I'm looking at the screen here at an angle, something like that would probably work. A couple of things. You don't want to be photographing at the closest, closest focusing distance unless the situation you're running into is truly in macro type situations. If you're a sports photographer working with a 402.8 lens, don't be taking pictures of tick marks on a ruler. Okay, use something that's a little more di of an appropriate distance. And again, you don't want to shoot square into something because there is no foreground and background then. It's got to be able to see front and back focus. So you got to be at a bit of an angle. And like I said, lens wide open and just try on a tripod, lock down, center focusing point, and then just experiment. Can you save those settings for various lenses? Yes, the question was can you save those settings for various lenses? And that's one of the cool things. You can. The camera knows what lens was on it when you made those shots. So if you make an adjustment and you say, okay, plus 15 gives me what I need with my, I don't know, my 135 F2, I'm just making my lens up. And then you take that lens off and put a different lens on, it goes back to zero. It knows that. When you put the 135 back on, it immediately goes back to plus or minus, you know, whatever you had. That's adjusting by individual lens. And then there's a setting where you can just adjust for all lenses. Yes. We get that question a lot. The question was, is it effective on aftermarket lenses? You just got to try it and see. There's no way we're going to guarantee proper operation with a third party lens, uh, but you can try it and see. It may be confused as well with a Canon lens. So if one moment you're using a third party 70 to 200 lens, and then whether it's because of a lens you own or a lens you borrow or something, you put a Canon 70 to 200 on, it may think this is the same lens and it'll kind of mess you up. So you're on your own on third party lenses. Right, it's a tool, it's a corrective tool okay. that prevents, like I say, having to send a camera in the service department. 99% of the time, you're not going to have to worry about so it. So if your lens is fine and working the way it's supposed to be, you wouldn't have to worry about it. Yep, just leave it alone. Yeah. It's just there for emergencies. One more. Oh, you try it and it doesn't do what you want it to do. It's just it's setting zero. Is there any danger of that? No, you can always reset it to zero and you can clear any corrections you've made. So if you, make a, if you say, okay, plus 10 would be ideal, 
and then you go and shoot some pictures and you say, oh, boy, I was way off on that. That's not right. I should have just left well enough alone. You can just clear whatever you put in and it goes back to the factory default. Quick question on autofocus points. Okay, one more and then I got to run. Yes, sorry. In choosing autofocus points, they're not all created equal, are they? They're not equal. Depends on the camera. Depends on the camera. So if you got questions on your camera, come see me afterwards, but it depends on the camera. So I'm still, I stand by what I said. The question was, are all autofocus points going to perform the same way? And I stand by what I said. And that's with any camera. Learn to explore your outer focusing points because they can be your friend. Last category of custom functions would be those for camera operation. And this starts to get you into what custom functions initially started as. And that's what do you do with different buttons? Changing what different buttons do, adding features and functionality. Here's an example. All of our cameras have a set button on the back of the camera, right? Usually in the middle of the quick control dial. Or in the case of Rebel cameras, it would be right in between the four uh, control keys uh, that you have on the back of the camera. Now normally, when you're shooting pictures, that set button does nothing. The set button is used for, you know, making menu settings and that kind of thing. But when you're just shooting pictures, normally that set button doesn't do a thing. But you can take your custom functions and you can have that set button be a useful shortcut to something that you want to get to quickly. Some of the things that you can do with the set button, depending on your camera, because some of the cameras have more of a list than others. You can have a call up any of these things automatically, instantly, by just pressing the set button when you're in the act of actually shooting pictures. In other words, not when you're playing them back or looking at the menu or whatever. Now, a lot of these are basically surrogates for buttons you already have on the camera. Uh, you know, for instance, most of the cameras have a picture style button, so you may you, know, you have the option of making that activate your picture style menu as well, but you may not find much need for that. But there are two of these that I find potentially extremely useful, and I think you ought to think about. One of them is the first one, changing image quality. Some of you in here, this may be a non-factor. If you're the type of person that says, hey, I just shoot raw images, I never shoot anything else, then you can ignore the rest of what I'm going to say. Uh, working for Canon as I do, I am often in the position of having to shoot sample pictures, whether they're used in presentations, whether they're going to be used for, you know, to test a camera, uh, or various other purposes. So sometimes I'm called upon to shoot full resolution JPEGs, sometimes I'm called upon to shoot full res raw images, sometimes small JPEGs, it varies. By setting changing image quality, by calling that up so that I can just press the set button and do it, it makes it very easy to quickly go from JPEGs to RAW or vice versa or something. And that can be very useful if you flip flop back and forth deliberately uh, on that a lot. The other one would be your flash exposure compensation if you are a Rebel shooter. Raise your hands for a moment, those of you in here regularly shoot with an EOS Rebel camera. Okay, so we got a fair number of you. Okay. One of the things about the Rebel is in its quest to simplify, some of the controls that you may need to work with frequently are kind of pushed into the background so that they're not there and potentially confusing to you. Flash exposure compensation normally requires a trip into the menu. Flash exposure compensation, if you take flash pictures, whether you use a built-in flash or whether you use one of the ETTL units, I guarantee you, you're going to need to access it from time to time. The newer cameras are better in terms of consistency of exposure, but there are going to be times where, oops, I'm sorry, where you need to be able to jump in there and quickly call up your flash compensation to lighten or darken the next flash picture you take. Having the ability to hit the set button and call that up instantly if you're a rebel shooter and you do a lot of flash pictures is a godsend. So if you're not using the set button for that purpose and you shoot with a rebel, I recommend you do. With a mid-range cameras like a 50D or a 7D or 5D or whatever, uh, there's a button on the camera for flash compensation so you don't have to worry about that. Now, another thing that a lot of our more advanced customers ask us for is mirror lockup. Mirror lockup when they're on a tripod to avoid potential little harmonic vibrations from the mirror sl slapping up when a picture is taken, give you sharper pictures in a lot of situations, especially at slower shutter speeds. Almost every Canon body, every current one, and I think the, the only EOS body, digital body I can think of that didn't have this was the very first digital Rebel, because that didn't have custom functions at all. Um, but every, all, all the other EOS bodies have mirror lockup capability. And that's going to be very useful anytime you're in a situation where you've got high magnification, whether it's close-ups, whether it's telephoto, 
Anything like that, mirror lockup is going to be very handy. Now, I always get asked, how come there isn't a separate button on the outside for mirror lockup? And the answer is, I don't know. We've asked our engineers for it on numerous occasions. But what you can do on those cameras that on the mode dial have a custom setting, a so-called letter C, like Charlie, setting on the mode dial, they let you memorize a set of conditions and then apply it to that so that you can instantly jump to it by just turning the mode dial to that C number or a C setting. So if, you like, if you're the type of shooter that does a lot of close-up work or landscape and nature and stuff and you want mirror lockup frequently, you don't want to dip into the custom functions, set it once, apply it to that custom setting if your camera has that, and then you can call it up right away. Now, this one I want to buzz through kind of quick, but it's one that is one of the most useful potentially custom functions, and it's also one that messes people up a lot because it's hard to understand, and I'll be perfectly candid, the way our menus are written doesn't really make it any easier to understand either. And that's the whole issue of back button autofocus. Back button autofocus means that we, instead of focusing by putting our finger halfway down on the shutter button, we're going to focus instead by using one of these two buttons. If your camera has an AF on button, by default it's that. If your camera doesn't have an AF on button, it would be the AE lock button. It has a little asterisk icon. And the idea is you press that button to focus. Now, the whole idea is to separate the act of focusing from the act of shooting. Shooting is still always going to be done by fully depressing the shutter button. That never changes. But what we've done is we've taken focus off the shutter button when we do this. Now you may, if you're not, if you haven't tried this, you may be wondering why on earth would I want to take autofocus off the shutter button? It's so convenient. Focus, you know, push halfway, focus, and then, you know, shoot my pictures. What's, you know, what's not to like? What's the problem? Well, there's a number of reasons why in some situations you may want to consider going to back button autofocus. One of them is you can shoot without the camera trying to kick in. One of the hardest things, once you focus on something, if, you're, if you, it's a non-moving subject and you're in one shot autofocus, if you lock focus on something by pushing the, your finger halfway down on the shutter button and holding it there, that's one of the hardest things the camera makes you do is keep that focus there, especially if you take more than one picture. So I could focus on one of these people here in the front row, you know, lock the focus and then move the camera a little bit, change my comp composition or whatever, and then take the picture. No big deal. But what if I want to take three or four pictures? Suppose I need to take a whole set of pictures. Suppose I want to go to my quick control dial and adjust my exposure compensation or whatever while I'm holding my finger halfway down on the shutter button. Easier said than done. You can halt the focus anytime you want and keep right on shooting. And also you can activate autofocus anytime you want by just pressing the back button. Couple things, focusing will only occur when your thumb is on the appropriate button. If you've set back button autofocus on your camera, it'll only occur, the camera will only be trying to focus when your thumb's on the button. As soon as you take your thumb off the button, stop focusing, period. Now you could shoot, a, you could shoot one picture, you can shoot a thousand pictures and the focus isn't gonna change until you press your thumb back on the button again. Here's an example, okay? Using an off-center focusing point, none of our cameras have a focusing point this far off-center. So even if we you know, use one of the focusing points in the upper right, we're still gonna move, you need to kind of move the camera a little bit, recompose, you know, focus on that subject, okay? Then bring the camera back, get the composition we want, and shoot the picture. Now, if we do this the old-fashioned way with our finger on the shutter button, again, one picture, probably no problem. But if I wanna take a whole series of pictures, then it becomes a little bit more of an issue because I got to keep my finger halfway down on that shutter button. And if I want to start, like I say, changing my exposures, if I'm an aperture priority and I say, okay, here's a shot wide open, what would this look like at f22? So I go to stop my lens down, you know, change the di turn the dial to pick a smaller aperture or whatever, I got to take my finger off the button. Put my finger back on the button to take the picture, what happens? I'm now focusing on one of these stones in the center, in the, towards the center here in the foreground. It's like, oh darn, you know, the camera refocused. All right, now I got to find the subject again, go back, do it again. Back button autofocus all of a sudden makes it real simple. I focus once, press my thumb on the button, get the, that part of the scene in focus, take my thumb off the button, recompose, and now I can, that, that subject isn't going anywhere. It's not moving, okay? And I'm not, let's just, let's just say for discussion's sake, I'm not moving. I can shoot to my heart's content. I can shoot all afternoon, and that focus isn't gonna change on me. Yes, you question. Have to set that up, or is that Back button auto, the question was, do you have to set back button auto focus up? And you do have to set it up, and I'm going to show you how. 
but it can avoid a lot of problems with the camera trying to fight you and refocus on things, particularly like I say, if you're shooting more than one. Great for portraits when you're way off center or something, you can focus once, you know, recompose, and then just go ahead and shoot. You know, tell us how you can, you know, take your hand off the camera and say, okay, you know, turn your head this way, you know, lift your chin up or whatever, and, you know, go right back to shooting. And again, as long as you haven't moved and the subject hasn't moved, you're good to go. If the subject does move, just press the thumb on the back button and you focus again. Another, inst another place you, that you can use it, and really the genesis of back button autofocus came from sports photographers who are dealing with moving subjects. And what they said was they wanted something where they could keep on shooting pictures and be able to momentarily halt autofocusing if something came in their path, a referee, something like that. Here's an example, okay? Servo autofocus, continuous autofocus. We got these guys walking off a football field. Now granted, this is not a fast moving subject, okay? But it illustrates the point. We're following these, this, these guys on the football team as they're walking off the football field. And there is clearly something in the foreground here. These guys are moving in that direction. So as we swing the camera there, what's gonna happen? Eventually the camera's gonna pick that subject up. And the camera's gonna try, after a certain period of time anyway, it's gonna try to focus on this new subject. Now if we keep on panning the camera, sure, it'll try to pick the subject up. And in this case, with these slow moving fo football players, they're just walking off the field, no problem. But what if it wasn't these guys walking off the field after pregame warmups? What if this was a wide receiver coming at full speed across the field and a referee steps in front of him? And the camera momentarily gets distracted and focuses on the referee and I keep moving the camera and I get back on the wide receiver, but moving at full speed, it's gonna be hard for the camera to pick that wide receiver up again. I may pick him up, I may not. With back button autofocus, as soon as I start to see that referee in the way, all I gotta do is just take my thumb off the, off the back button for a second. I can keep right on shooting, just pass the referee, and as soon as I'm past him, hit the button again. The camera hasn't been thrown off by the presence of that referee. I am much more likely to pick that receiver up and be able to continue shooting a sequence of sharp pictures of him. It's a great, great tool in certain situations. Do you have to hold the button? Yeah. If you, want it, if you want active focusing, your thumb has to be on the back button. I have I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Right. We're not talking what focusing point you're using now. We're just talking, hey, are we focusing or are we not focusing? Does it matter the distance? Question was, does it matter what distance, distance you are to the subject? No. It's, you can use it for macro shots. Uh, you can use it for distance shots. It doesn't matter. The whole idea is, do you want it to focus? Do you not want it to focus? And you can control them separately off the shutter button. If hold that thought for a second. Question was if you have it at the shutter button, won't it cancel itself? I'm gonna to get to that in a moment. In macro shots, it can be real handy too, because once you focus on something, whether you focus with manu full time manual or whether you use autofocus, you got the focus set, you can go ahead and shoot, and the camera's not gonna to try to kick the focus in and now, you know, get thrown off by something that doesn't have a lot of detail, and then the focus starts hunting on you or whatever. It can speed things up dramatically. Now, here's what Here's part of what throws people off is the way the menus are worded. I'm going to try to jump through this kind of quickly. If you have questions about it, best thing is probably to come up and see me afterwards and I'll explain further. But I'll try to clarify this for you so that when you look at the menus on your camera, they'll start making a modicum of sense. Depending on the camera you have, the back button autofocus can be with either the AF on button, if your camera has a third AF on button on the back, or if it doesn't, It'll say on the menu with, you know, shutter AE lock button. And basically, what this is, the key to understanding this and what these menus are telling you, what your options are, is a couple of things. Understand that number one, it says shutter AE lock button, and there's a slash in between them. Before the slash indicates what's going to happen when you press the shutter button halfway down. When you fully press it, it's going to take a picture no matter what. That doesn't change. It's what happens when you push the button halfway down. After the slash is what's gonna happen when you press the back button. You're gonna have focus, you're gonna have AE lock, you're gonna have something else. Then it helps to understand the nomenclature. If it says AF, what they mean is, hey, push it in, like I say, with the shutter button it's halfway, with the back button it's just push it. It'll start autofocus, so if you see AF, that's what it means. We'll start autofocus. 
If it says AE, auto exposure, that means we will start metering. We'll start light metering. We'll wake the camera up and start metering, but not focus. AE lock means we'll also start metering, but it'll lock it instantly. So that in other words, once you lock it, if you keep your finger halfway on the shutter button or whatever, if you move the camera around, exposure's not gonna change. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that can mess you up. AF lock means focus lock. In other words, we press this button and continuous focus is suddenly gonna lock. Some photographers like to autofocus at the shutter button, shooting their sports or whatever, and have a button at the back that they can just simply lock focus with when that referee comes in front of them or whatever. So that's another option that some of the cameras are gonna give you. So just, oops. So just looking at this real quick, the default operation, First one, zero, that's a factory default. AF means, hey, I press the shutter button. The thing that comes first before the slash is what happens when I push the shutter button down halfway. It's gonna autofocus. Press the back AE lock button, it's gonna give me AE lock. That's factory default. If I wanna change that, for instance, I can go to option one. What happens is, if I press the AE lock button, I get autofocus. I get back button autofocus. And if I press the shutter button, I don't get focus anymore. What's gonna happen is it's gonna lock the exposure. And then I can also get autofocus with option three at the back button, okay, AF, and it says no AE lock. So the difference between option three and option one, both of them give me back button autofocus. One of them is gonna let me have, if I'm in automatic exposure, like aperture priority or something, it's gonna have continually updated re meter readings if I'm taking a sequence of pictures. Whereas on the other one with AE lock, Whatever I metered for the first shot, it's gonna lock it in there and keep it no matter how many pictures I take in that burst. But I will get continuous autofocus. Some of the newer cameras with the AF on button, they've changed the wording up a little bit. So if you have a camera like a 5D Mark II, a 7D, any of the 1D Mark III's or Mark IV's, you'll see right, right, uh, wording like this. Again, shutter button, AF on button. What happens when you press the shutter button halfway? What happens when you press the AF on button? The one that's confusing, well, one of the ones that's confusing is the first one where it just says meter plus AF start, but there's no slash. Basically what that means is on these cameras, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, so don't ask me why it is this way, I'll be perfectly candid. But on these cameras, if you press out of the box, if you press the shutter button down halfway, you get autofocus. If you press the AF on button on the back, you get autofocus. So it's basically the, same, the two buttons are doing the same thing which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, but it just it is the way it works. However, you can dedicate the back button to autofocus with uh, this option here. Meter plus AF start means the back button is gonna start autofocus. Or this one here, same thing. And the difference is, when I press the shutter button, one's gonna lock exposure, and one's not gonna lock exposure. So exposure would stay fluid and change if I take a sequence of pictures and we move from light to dark or something like that. Yeah, if you, the question was on a camera like a Rebel that doesn't have an AF on button, do you press the AE lock button with the asterisk icon? The answer is yes. Yes. Sure. The question was if you've got a constantly moving subject like a football player, the distance is changing, uh, would AE lock, excuse me, focus lock be inappropriate in that situation? If you kept the focus there, yeah, more than likely it would. The idea is though, if you have an interference, something in front of you like a referee, you can quickly get by that interference, hold the focus where it was, and then pick that subject up again, and you're not dealing with such a defocused condition trying to pick that subject up after the referee has passed. I understand. I, under I understand, but what I'm saying is when you go to pick them back up again, you're starting from a much closer position on the lens than you would be if you let it focus on a foreground object that was in front of you. That's why I said you're much more likely to pick that subject up again if you either stop focusing with, by pulling your thumb off the back button or if, for those who like to use AE lock, AF lock on the back, if you push it and lock the focus momentarily when you get a distraction like that than if you let the camera focus on that foreground object. That's gonna mess you up. If your camera has that third AF on button, it'll also have another custom function that says AF on AE lock button switch. 
And I, I have to admit, the first time I saw that wording, I was like, huh? What does that mean? Basically, all it means is you're going to reverse the role of those two buttons. Uh, so for photographers who used our older cameras and liked back button autofocus with the AE lock button, if you prefer to use that AE lock button, it's not quite as much of a stretch with your thumb to the new AF on button. Uh, if you prefer to use this button, activate this custom function and you simply reverse what these two buttons do. That's all. You may see a big, uh, custom function in your camera called focusing screen if you have one of these cameras. These cameras have interchangeable focusing screens. You can go in and change the focusing screen, a very useful feature in some situations. But the camera has to know what focusing screen is in it to get proper exposure. So once you put in a different focusing screen, the grid screen or one of those EFS screen, one of the S series screens, uh, you got to tell it for proper metering what screen is in it. And that's what that custom function is for. A lot of you in here are shooting with the Rebel cameras, and if you have one of the newer ones, the camera gives you information on the back, on, using the LCD monitor, gives you general shooting information, shutter speed, aperture, ISO, all that good stuff, as well as letting you see your pictures after they're taken and so on. Now, that LCD monitor being on frequently can be a source of battery drain. So if you're just walking, you know, you take a couple of shots and then you're walking around the Bronx Zoo or whatever, and you know, you're kind of just you know, in transit from you know, one place to another, you may want to turn that display off so that it's not consuming battery power. If you hit the display button, it'll do just that. Just hit the button once and the display will go off. The camera's still on, but it just, you just turn the display off. Now, there's a custom function called LCD when power on. Once again, the wording is a little bit of a head scratcher. All they're saying here is if you press that display button yourself and turn the display off to save battery power or whatever, what happens if you turn the camera off after that, either immediately or just, you know, later on? When you turn the camera back on, is the display going to just come on or is the display going to stay off like you asked it to before? That's what this custom function is about. <coughs> so the default on these Rebel cameras, and this is a non-factor if you're using a camera that has an LCD panel on the top like a 7D or a 50D or something like that. But the Rebels don't have this panel, so they display it on the LCD monitor on the back of the camera. So the default operation is, hey, anytime you turn the camera off or the camera goes to sleep on its own, when you wake it up by turning it on or just pressing the shutter button halfway, that display on the back will come on. That's the default. If you didn't want it to, either to save battery power or because you're in a dark area, like maybe in a church service or something, and that LCD monitor flashing on could be a little disturbing to people around you or something, the retain power off status option means that when you turn the camera back on, the display will stay off if you had shut it off previously. This is one most of you are probably not going to have to deal with, but it's good to know what they're talking about. You may see a function on your camera that says original decision data or image verification data. They changed the wording as we moved into some of the newer cameras, but it means the same thing. There are certainly some photographers out there uh, working either professionally or in the context of their business who, whether they're taking press pictures, whether they're taking pictures for medical reasons, you know, medical documentation or whatever, insurance purposes. There are photographers who have to shoot pictures where they have to be able, or may potentially, I should say, have to be able to verify, perhaps way later on, that this is an unretouched original image. That this, indeed, you know, if it ever, a case ever came to court or something, that hey, this is, you know, the medical records of, you know, Joe Smith, you know, here's his first visit to the hospital, here's his second, here's his third, and so on. Um, and, Hope there's nobody named Joe Smith in the room. Um, but what we have is a system in our cameras where if you get an accessory that is called the Data Verification Kit, it's an optional accessory for Windows computers only, it'll let you verify that image JPEG or RAW images are completely unretouched, have not been changed in any way. They are exactly as they came out of the camera. It can verify that. And if you have any of these cameras that you see up here, you can shoot images and then later on 
have them looked at by a computer with this data, data verification software on it and have it verify in court or whatever that yes, this is an unretouched original image. One additional feature which is kind of neat is if you shoot with a 1D Mark III or a Mark IV, another byproduct of this is you can set it up so that images on your card cannot be opened except on your computer. So if somebody ever took your card or something and you're concerned about that kind of security, uh, that they wouldn't, the images wouldn't do them any good. They can't open them. However, to be able to use any of this, when you shoot the pictures, you have to put a little tag on each image as you take it. That's what this image verification data custom function is about. And it may read like this, add original decision data or add verification data. The factory default is off. It's not going to add anything. On means it adds a little additional piece of information to every picture you take. And that information is used by that data verification software if the time, if the need ever comes up. Again, I understand for the vast majority of individual photographers, it's a non-issue. You'll never have to worry about it. But A, if you work in a kind of business or something where that might be a factor, or uh, if you just were always curious about what the heck is that, that's what it's about. Yes? The question was, is there any downside to leaving it on just for the in case? And the answer is really no. It's a tiny additional file that it adds. So it's not like it doubles your file size for each picture you take or it slows the camera down or anything like that. It's, it, there's essentially no downside to leaving it on. Uh, again, if you think that you ever might need to use it, that's the only thing. But you can't go back after the fact. In other words, I can't take pictures today with that off in my camera. And then six months from now, it's like, Ooh, you know, I shot pictures of a traffic accident out there and now they want to see them in court and the defense attorney is saying that these are manipulated. I got no way to prove it then. You got to have it on when you take the pictures. Yes? What about Macintosh users? Unfortunately, the, the question was what about Macintosh users? Unfortunately, to date, the data verification software is only available for Windows. I'm a Mac user myself, as you can see. Uh, so I, I feel your pain, but as it sits right now, it's, I guess the, in, the intent was that it was primarily going to be for organizations and businesses that would be getting into that. So it is a Windows only piece of software. Question was, is it going to be coming out soon in a Mac version? Don't hold your breath. You never know. <laughs> yes. You shouldn't. We'll talk about it afterwards. The question was that somebody said they had a problem with the camera slowing down. It's, it's a small enough file that it shouldn't make much difference, but we can talk about that after the presentation if you like. One more. Oh, one last question about that. But if you have a Mac and you were in a situation where it were needed, somebody with a PC would be able to access it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. That's a good point. The young lady's question was if you had a Mac and you were either in a business where that was necessary or in a situation where you're thinking it might be necessary to, to turn that on, the data verification on, if somebody, if you, if, pick, if you tested your pictures in a Windows computer that had the software, you could do that. Absolutely. So if you, you know, went to a, an attorney's office or something and they had a PC there and they had that data verification software, yeah, you could absolutely do that. What happens if you made a virtual copy? Would that also... What do you mean a virtual copy? It's like, it's like a copy. If, you, if it's a literal copy, as far as, the, as far as it's concerned, it's the same image. It's an unretouched image. It hasn't changed. The data hasn't... The question was, what if you make a copy of the image? As far as the data verification software is concerned, it's an unretouched image. You haven't changed anything in the image. So it, it'll still verify it as being original. On the other hand, if it sees, I, I'll, this is the last thing I'll say about it, we gotta move on. I took an image once, a JPEG image, went, opened it up in Photoshop, magnified it to 1600% in Photoshop. That's the maximum magnification you can get on screen. And I selected one pixel on an image, and I changed the color of that one pixel. And then, you know, closed it back down and put it in the data verification software, and it immediately coughed that picture up and said, this isn't original. Because it thought that it thought that something had been changed, so it, it does work pretty effectively. But again, I understand it's for most amateur shooters, even professionals that are doing commercial work and stuff. Not something you're going to have to worry about. We've talked about the different groups of popular custom functions, so the, the functions dealing with exposure, autofocus, camera operations, and so on, that pretty much are constant throughout the range. You know, yeah, some cameras have more than others. I want to talk now about functions that are in two cameras that really sort of stand apart. Uh, and those would be the EOS 7D and the 1D Mark, Mark IV and the previous 1D Mark III's as well. There's some custom functions that these cameras share 
that really are special. Yeah, it doesn't mean you're always going to use them, but these are very powerful cameras with a lot of interesting tools in them that from time to time can really influence in a positive way your photography. One is a big time saver. With either of these cameras, you can add aspect ratio information. You can go right on the menu and tell it, hey, I want to shoot images that have a 5 by 7 aspect ratio because I'm going to make 5 by 7 prints. Or I want to shoot images that are going to have a 4 by 5 aspect ratio because I got to make a bunch of 8 by 10 prints. You can set it right on the camera and then when you bring those images into Canon's DPP software, whether they're JPEGs or RAWs, doesn't matter, it'll send those images to Photoshop as 8 by 10s or you know 4 by 5 crop images, 5 by 7 crop images, 6 by 6 square crop images, whatever you want. You're not, when you apply the aspect ratio information here, you're not literally cropping the file. All the pixel information throughout the entire frame still remains. But you're telling the system, hey, if you want to apply a shortcut so that somebody that's shooting an event that has to crank out a whole bunch of prints doesn't have to size up each one in Photoshop or a similar program. They can just have the images sized up. And you can print right from DPP, in fact, which is kind of neat. And they'll be cropped and printed exactly as you shoot. If you had to, you know, get roped into shooting a bunch of team pictures at your kid's little league or something like that, bingo. It's, they're all set and ready to go. It's a time saver, potentially. Now, yeah, there are going to be some limitations. You can't adjust the crop in terms of moving it left or right. It's a centered crop. But there's an awful lot of choices that you have here with this add aspect ratio information. And it really, like I say, for people that are on a deadline and they have to crank out a bunch of prints, this can be a big time saver. DPP will send them to Photoshop, and that's fine, you know, as cropped images. And if you change your mind, if you say, well, I thought those square cropped wedding pictures like, you know, the old uh, medium format photographers used to shoot would be a cool idea, but geez, it, it just didn't work out, all you got to do is just open them up in DPP and just clear the crop marks. And then you're back to a full, you know, two by three rectangle type of image. Um, yeah. Did you actually see these crop Oh, that's a good question. That's a real good question. The question was, do you see the crop marks in the viewfinder? The answer is, in the eye level viewfinder, you don't. If you're using live view on the back of the camera, then you do. Then you will see the crop marks appear and they change as you change them. Yes? You have this option here, you go to DPP later on and it says it's like 2 by 4 or 4 by 5. Gentleman's question was if you have it off initially when you take the pictures and then you go into the Canon Digital Photo Professional software afterwards, can you apply a crop then? Yeah, absolutely. You just have to kind of do it by hand then. It's, there's a way to do it in batches, but it's just not quite as convenient as doing it in the camera if you know ahead of time that you're going to need to crank out a whole bunch of pictures. On this, there's a whole bunch of choices, more than what you see here, and in fact you see that there's actually a scroll bar on the menu if your camera has this feature so that you can scroll down and get to the other choices there. We're talking about custom functions that are unique to the 7D and the 1D series. This is one of my favorites. If you own one of these cameras and you have not experienced this, you need to. This is orientation linked AF points. And what this means is that you can select a focusing point for your horizontal shots. You can select a different focusing point for your vertical shots. And when you turn the camera from horizontal to vertical, the camera will instantly change the focusing point for you. When you turn it back to horizontal, it'll change the focusing point back to where you had it. This is a neat, neat feature. Uh, one of the reasons I love the 7D camera, the 1D Mark IV shares this feature as well. Unfortunately, the Mark III series cameras don't have it. And you go into the, your custom functions and you see orientation linked AF point. And basically, to turn it on, just go to option one, which is select different AF points. And then you've enabled it. Out of the box, the camera won't do it. You've got to enable it here in custom functions first. But this is a, that's a, this is a nice one. Another cool thing you can do with these cameras is memorize a focusing point and then jump back to it instantly. So you can be, you know, in the center or anywhere else and you can memorize a different point and then just hit a button and jump right back to that. It's called switch to registered AF point. Registered in Canon lingo means memorized. So for photographers who like to use the center focusing point, you can set the camera for a center focusing point. This illustration shows the EOS 7D. And if you realize that, hey, the center focusing point's a good idea, but it's not appropriate for everything, you can have pre-memorized a different point and jump to it instantly. 
All you got to do is just push a button after you've set it in the beginning to begin with. With the 7D, you've got the option to press the AF on button and do this, the AE lock button and do this, or the uh, multi controller and do this. With the 1D and the 1DS series, you basically got the option of doing it with the multi controller or with the AE lock button. Your choice. But it's a very cool feature to let you quickly jump from one point to another. Another thing these cameras share is the ability to change the characteristics of how they focus on moving subjects. I'm not talking about now just changing a focusing point. I'm talking about changing the way the camera thinks, changing how it processes information. There's a number of different ways these, two, these cameras, the 1D and 1DS series cameras and the 7D together, allow you to do this. It's a tremendous amount of control. Now in the beginning, I don't, rec I don't recommend you get too bogged down in you know, hung up on this. But down the road, if you find yourself shooting challenging subjects, whether it's birds in flight, whether it's shooting sports with a, you know, with a 400 or a 600 millimeter lens, these can be very, very useful. One of them is, let me go back a second. One of them is you're shooting moving subjects in servo, tracking a moving subject. We talked a little bit about this before, but in a different context. Something comes in front of you. What's the camera gonna do? How long is it going to take it to focus on that subject that cut in front of you that you really weren't trying to focus on? How long is it going to take? How sensitive is it going to be to sudden changes? And what you have is a function called AI servo tracking sensitivity. And when you call it up, you'll see a little scale that looks like this with slow, fast, and a middle setting. And basically, the slow setting means the system is going to respond to a change like that slower it's going to give you a perceptible one Mississippi to get back on that original subject, to let that player in the foreground pass by. Fast, on the other hand, means that when the system sees a, you're tracking a subject and it sees a sudden change, something comes in the foreground or whatever, it's going to aggressively try to jump on that new subject. Your choice. What, one thing to be aware of, be very clear of, what fast doesn't mean is that it's just going to speed up autofocus. In other words, if I've got an Indy car coming straight down the, run, down, the, down the straightaway at me and I'm shooting it with one of the big lenses, fast does not mean I'm going to get more sharp pictures than slow. All it means is that if something, if I miss the subject because the subject's zigging and zagging and all of a sudden for a moment I'm on the background rather than on the subject that I thought I was, or if something cuts in front of it, how quick is the camera going to react to that new thing it sees? It's going to react fast. Or slow. Most of the time with most of the cameras, the standard setting or even the slow settings are probably going to be the way to go. But you know, some people prefer to set it to fast depending on the way they like to work. Yes? Is it ever also in the video modes? Uh, no. That's a good question. The young lady's question was, what about in the video modes? Does any of this apply in the video modes? And the answer is no. There is no serve in the current cameras. There is no continuous servo autofocus when you switch the video on a 5D Mark II or a 7D or whatever. Yes? Might be, if you think, uh, the gentleman's question was if you, if you know you want to keep the, the camera on one thing, might it be best to keep it on slow? Yeah, if you think there's a possibility you're going to possibly lose that subject if you're working with a big heavy lens like a 400 2.8 or something, or whatever lens, it doesn't have to be that, and the subject's going to be moving around erratically or something, yeah, that's, that could be useful. But understand, this is what the function does. If you understand what it does, then you're in a position to experiment with it in the field and start utilizing it in different situations. One setting is not always going to fit every situation. I'm not saying go out and make yourself crazy always experimenting with this every time you go to shoot a picture. But just understand what the settings do and that from time to time, if the camera is not doing what you want, you've got, the, you've got the keys to go in there and do something about it. That's really what all this is about. Yeah, SHI, does that have that on there? No. We're talking a seven. The question was, was, does a camera like a Rebel XSI or one of the Rebel series cameras have this? The answer is no. Uh, this is something that you don't see on the entry level cameras. You do see on the top of the line 1D Mark III's and 1D Mark IV's and the 1DS Mark III. And you also see it now on the 7D as well. But as it sits right now, that's it. Yes? You have AI servo, but that's different. You, it's one setting. You can't change the way it okay. thinks. 
Yes. No. Question was, can you have have we been able to change these uh, or add this functionality to other cameras like a 5D Mark II or something that doesn't have them out of the box? The answer is no. As it sits right now, these are something you see on the 1D, 1DS cameras and the 7D. As it sits right now, end of story. Uh, you know, you never know what the future may bring, but I wouldn't want to mislead you and tell you, oh yeah, we'll have a firmware upgrade for you know other cameras. It's probably unlikely. Another one that on these cameras you'll see is one called AI Servo First and Second Image Priority. And this one, another one may seem a little confusing at first. Basically what it's asking is, on the first shot you take, and for that matter, on subsequent shots in a sequence, you take a burst of pictures or something coming at you or whatever, is the camera going to give priority to shooting pictures as fast as it can, or is it going to give priority when needed to taking an extra split second or so to make sure the focus is as good as it can be? You got the choice to tell the camera to do one or the other. The default is it's going to take that extra little bit of time to get the focus as right as it can. That's the default. First image means when you go to take a picture, just bang, press your finger on the button. Is the camera going to fire with the minimum possible amount of lag time, or is it going to allow you a little extra time to make sure focus is dead on? Again, the default is it's going to allow a little extra time. But there's some photographers doing certain kinds of work, press work, where maybe they're not going to be needing, you know, super, super tack sharp pictures, but the split second timing is the important thing. They may want that to be able to capture that decisive moment. So you've got the ability to go with either AF priority, which is a default. That means it's going to take a little extra time to get the focus right. Or release priority, which means it's going to prioritize taking the picture as fast as it can, even if the focus isn't dead, dead on. I'm, I'm going to get to that. question was what I mean by tracking priority, and that's, um, that's next. Another feature on these cameras, the high-end cameras, is what they call the AI Servo AF tracking method. This one probably wins the prize for the most confusingly worded menu in our system. Okay, but I am going to set you straight. What this, what this custom function is about is if you have expanded your focusing points. We showed you before how the high-end cameras, you can pick one focusing point, but you can expand that with you know, a cluster of points. If you have expanded your focusing points on a 1D series camera or a 7D, and you're shooting a moving subject, you're tracking a moving subject, and something is about to enter the cluster of points. You're on this guy number 16 here, focusing on him. But this guy number 51 is starting to come into the picture real quick. If he goes into the picture a little bit more and the outer points start to pick him up, what's the camera going to do? Is the camera going to say, Oop, I'm not paying attention to him, I'm on number 16? Or is the camera going to say, well, it's, we got something closer to the camera, let's jump to that. What's it going to do in terms of a new subject? Now, here's where the wording gets totally hairy. Again, this, the function is called AI Servo AF Tracking Method. Once again, I repeat, if you own a 7D or a 1D Mark III or Mark IV, you have this custom function on your camera. If you don't own one of those cameras, don't look for it. It's not on your camera. But just understand, hey, if you were to step up to one of these cameras, this is part of what you're paying for. The factory default is called Main Focus Point Priority. What in the heck does that mean? Basically what that means is that the camera is going to try to refocus on the new subject if it enters the outer area. If they're nearer than your subject you're tracking. Why it's expressed that way and frankly why that would be the factory default, I do not know. Continuous AF track priority means the camera is going to try to ignore that subject. If I'm on that fellow number 16 in that example I showed you a moment ago, and it's seeing him, if something else starts to get into the outer area of focusing points, it's going to ignore it. Okay? If you own one of these cameras and you shoot moving subjects, I strongly recommend most of the time you use this option which means you're going to have to go into your custom functions and change it. But I think you'll find that the autofocus behavior is a lot more consistent and predictable if you do. 
I'm sorry? <laughs> Thank you. A couple of things that are unique to the 7D. This camera really is special in terms of some of the things that it brought to the table. I'm not here to sell you on this camera. If you own a different camera model, you like the camera you're using, keep right on using it. But if people ask, you know, what's special about the 7D? If I own a 50D or a Rebel or anything, what's the 7D bring into my experience that I wouldn't have otherwise? Here's a couple of things. In terms of autofocus, there's the ability, first off, to have it display all the focusing points. Normally when you, let me go back for a second, normally when you manually pick in your focusing points, you see the one point on screen and that's it. There are 19 focusing points in this system. Normally you see this in the viewfinder, one point at a time. If you want to see where the other points are as a reference, you can call those up. Let's display all AF points as a custom function. You have the ability to go in and change the way the focusing points are working, one point at a time. A spot point where you're using just a part of a point a cluster of expanded points, and so on. 7D is extremely flexible in this regard, more so than any other camera we make. But when you buy the camera, if you want to be able to explore all those options, you've got to go into this custom function, select area, AF area selection mode, and you've got to activate your expanded points and your spot points. And all you do is select it and hit the set button, and a little check appears. This also lets you take away any modes you don't want to use. If you're the type of person that says, that says I never, ever, ever will use automatic point selection. You could go in and select this, hit the set button, and a little check mark will disappear. And you can always call it back up again later. One of the cool things this camera brought to the table that we never had before is when you're in servo, if you do use the automatic focusing points, all the points are active and you're shooting a moving subject, is you can pick the point you want to start with, and if the camera moves away from that, it'll follow it and change points for you. We didn't have that before, where you could pick the point and then with a moving subject, continue to track that subject across the whole AF point area, and it would follow it and continually update you in the finder with what focusing points were being used. It's kind of cool. Some photographers using that find it re works reasonably well, but they find that having all those points kind of come and go is a little distracting. So if you find it distracting, you can turn the display off. This is one of the cool ones, is uh, the custom controls. On this camera, there are 10 different controls with custom function 4.1 that you can go in and totally reprogram. And one of the cool things is when you're doing this, it shows you on a little map here, not map, but on a little icon, which dial or button or whatever you're dealing with each time. So when I pick one of these things, if I forget, well, what's that, what's that icon mean? Is that the multi-controller? Is that the quick control dial or whatever? It highlights which one it is on the back of the camera. So you can see what control we're talking about. A couple of quick examples. This thing, little thing here is the shutter button. What happens when you press the button halfway down? Well, I got a choice of having it do my metering and my autofocus, which is the default. I got a choice of taking autofocus away from it, having metering only, continuous metering, or I can go, to, go and have it be AE lock, a locked exposure as soon as I push the button down halfway. The AF on button. I can change what it does. I can have it be autofocus. I can have it be a focus lock. I can have it be a flash exposure lock. I can have it be a number of different things. I can even turn it off. If I don't want it to do anything, I can disable it. <coughs> the other thing I can do, I told you this before, you can, there are three buttons on the camera you can program so that when you hit them, you'll instantly return to a memorized focusing point. So if I press the info button, I'll go to this menu here. And now I have a choice of when I hit that AF start point button, or the AF start button rather, I can have it either pick, just start focusing on the point I was at, or I can have it return to a point I memorized. HP doesn't mean horsepower, it means home position. That means I've memorized the focusing point. And by pressing that, if I set it here, and I've told the system, hey, when I press that button, jump me back to a point I memorized. Yes? Yep, you can do that. Question was, can you put autofocus to two different buttons? Yeah, you can do it if you want to. So basically, that's the way you'd memorize a focusing point and have it jump back to that. Even the depth of field preview button can be used for a host of different things, not just depth of field. So there's a lot of functionality built into this. Now, one I want to touch on real quick is the new multi-function button. That's a little button on the 7D right by the shutter button. Little button right adjacent to the shutter button. It's labeled MFN, as in multi-function. 
That button lets you call up a very cool feature. You can change it and have it do a number of different things, but one of them is the last one, which is an in-camera, dual-axis, electronic-level display. This is neat. This is the first camera in the world that can tell you when you've got the camera turned slightly sideways or when you got the camera tilted up or down. And you can see it with this, if you activate that button, you can see it right in the viewfinder. So if you're in a situation where you've got a lot of straight lines in the picture, yeah, you can kind of line it up with the top of the camera, or you can use the grid line display and get a visual look. But a lot of times we're shooting subjects that don't have a lot of clearly defined lines, but we still want to make sure that the image is level. <coughs> So the situations where the grid lines don't always work. If I press that button, my focusing points instantly change to a level display. If I get this display, it's telling me, hey, the camera is perfectly level. It's not tilted up, it's not turned to the side, it's perfectly level. If I start to tilt the camera a little bit to the side, I'm going to start to get this. And as we move off center, it means in this case that the right side of the camera is progressively tilted up. If I tilt the front of the camera up, I start getting this. So you can tell at a glance, no matter what kind of subject you're shooting at, if you're shooting something at an angle or something, you can tell at a glance when you got the camera positioned right and when you don't, even if you're not working with a tripod, when you're just taking eye level pictures. A magnificent, magnificent feature. The 1D Mark IV and the 1D series also have some unique features, and we'll close with a few of those. We talked about speeding up focusing point selection on these cameras and how you can do it with the multi-controller direct on the back of the camera, the quick control dial direct. Well, there's some other things you can do too. One is to reduce the number of focusing points you have. These cameras have 45 focusing points, but you can cut the number of focusing points back. The Mark III's let you manually choose from 19 points. The Mark IV lets you manually choose from 45, but you can cut that back to 19, you can cut it back to 11, or you can cut it back to either what they call an inner nine or an outer nine points. Another thing you can do is you got the ability to navigate around this by just turning the quick control dial. This is a cool feature. You can do it with just the multi-controller as well. 19 points, inner 9, outer 9, by just using your multi-controller and just kind of go from one to another, which is kind of neat. But if you, if you own one of these cameras, those of you in the room who may own a 1D Mark III, 1DS Mark III, or a 1D Mark IV, this is about the only time I'm going to tell you to do this. Write these functions down. This combination. Because what this lets you do if you combine these two functions is you can just turn your rear quick control dial and you can go around the mulberry bush there. And it is so neat to be in the center one moment, off center the next moment by doing nothing more than turning the dial on the back of the camera with your thumb. So easy to do, so quick to do. You may be wondering, okay, well, if I do that, what happens to my exposure control that was here at the dial? Press the focus point selector button and turn the top main dial, and that would do what the quick control dial used to do. And of course, like any custom function, you can always go back and disable this. Spot metering. The 1D series cameras give you the option to link spot metering to a focusing point. Spot metering is normally right in the dead center, but you've got the ability, if you reduce the number of points, to have your spot metering follow whatever focusing point you're using. And this is kind of neat because what it means is you can focus on something and spot meter off it at the same time. One, basically one composition, focus, compose, and take a spot meter reading off of it all at the same time without having to kind of move the camera around. Only the 1D series cameras and the 1DS series cameras allow you to do this at present. Unfortunately, the 5Ds and even the 7D don't allow you to do this. It would be cool if they did, but they don't. There's a feature called AE and FE micro adjustment. We talked about AF micro adjustment, that focus micro adjustment. Every once in a while, we'll get a critical professional photographer. And understand, these are our top of the line professional cameras. Every so often, we'll get a critical professional photographer who says, hey, you know, I've got several camera bodies and one of them just meters a little different. If I shoot a gray card image or something, a test image, one camera is always just a little bit lighter, a little bit darker than my other cameras, and I really need them to be all dead on. Well, in the past, that meant sending the camera into the service department for an adjustment, and sometimes there was some trial and error involved until you got it, what the photographer thought was just right. 
You've got the ability now with the 1D Mark IV for your flash exposure, your TTL flash, or for your ambient exposure, two separate things, to adjust it in one eighth of a stop increments, plus or minus one stop, so that you can match one camera to another camera. This is totally on top of your regular exposure compensation. This is just to fine tune the metering system itself. This is one that I love on the new cameras. It's called white balance image size media on LCD. And basically what it is is those settings, setting the white balance, setting the image quality, and managing your memory cards, because the 1Ds can take one or two memory cards at the same time, are usually done either by going into the menu or on the little LCD panel on the back here. The problem with the panel is it's small. It does have an illuminator to light it up, but it's small. It's hard to read, even for you know folks with good eyesight and so on. You can change it so that instead of that, read, that showing up here when you press the function button, that these things show up on the big menu instead. I highly recommend that if you own one of these cameras. It'll really make your life a lot easier. And again, that's under the menu setting, uh, the custom function setting, excuse me, of white balance, image size, media on LCD. It just means do you want the, those settings to show up on the little panel or the big panel? That's what the screen would look like. A couple more as we wind down real quick. The 1Ds give you, as you can see, tremendous, tremendous flexibility. People say, what am I paying for with these cameras? They cost you know, so much more than a camera like a 5D or a 7D. What am I paying for? This is some of what you're paying for. One of the things you can do is control how long the meter is going to stay active either before or after you take a picture. Most of the cameras, if you just touch the shutter button halfway, don't take a picture and take your finger off, the meter stays on for six seconds and goes out. If you use the flash exposure lock or your multi-spot metering or whatever, if the camera has that, it'll stay on for 16 seconds. And then if you take a picture and then take your finger off the button after you take the picture, the meter will stay on for two seconds and then it goes out. Now for ordinary picture taking, no big deal. And many of our photographers are using cameras like a 50D or a 7D or a Rebel and they never miss that. It's just it's the way the camera works, end of story. But if you've gone to the bother of taking a real careful meter reading and you want to take more than one picture, sometimes you want that meter reading to stay for more than two seconds after the picture's taken. These cameras allow you to go in within the custom function and change any of those three timer settings, the six second one, the 16 second one, and the two second one, at three separate settings. You can change them from zero seconds so they go out immediately to an hour. And the only catch with setting them so that they, they, last, they stay on a long time is you will go through battery power more quickly if you do. But other than that, it's a great thing. If you use any of these controls for exposure, if you find yourself using one of those controls frequently and you own a Mark III or a Mark IV camera, you should consider going in and lengthening, particularly the time, of expo the, time the meter stays on after exposure. Because, you know, you take a picture, you want it to, if you've taken, you know, the bother of, you know, make, taking a careful spot meter reading or something, you'd like it to stick around for more than two seconds after the picture's taken. This will let you do that. A couple other things real quick and then, then that'll be, uh, you know, we'll wind down. There's a short and release time lag. You can change the lag time at the shutter button. How long will the camera wait until it takes a picture when you push the button down fully? It's already the shortest in our lineup at 55 milliseconds, but you can shorten it down to as little as 40 milliseconds. Now you may be wondering, why is that a custom function? Why wouldn't you just leave it at 40 milliseconds all the time? Well, the reason is, if you enable this, what happens is, as the lens aperture changes, that is, if one minute I take a picture with the lens wide open, the next minute I take a picture with the lens aperture stopped down three stops or whatever, it takes time to stop the diaphragm down. And what happens is to real sensitive photographers who are very skilled at working with cameras, they can feel the difference in lag time between wide open and stop down a little bit. So if I shorten the lag time, it's shortest when the lens is wide open. But you're going to feel a difference as you start to close it down to smaller apertures. Whereas if you leave it disabled and the system is locked in at 55 milliseconds, it stays constant pretty much through. So you, if, for a photographer who's shooting sports, for instance, using a lens like a 600 f4 or a 400 2.8 or a 300 2.8 and is regularly shooting at a wide open aperture, they may want to enable this and reduce the time lag even further to get those split second moments, you know, wide receivers jumping up to catch a pass or whatever and get, you know, just a little faster response. 
Um, but again, if you're a photographer that one minute is shooting at smaller apertures and the next minute is shooting wide open, there'll be a difference that the sensitive people will feel. Bracketed shots. We talked about auto bracketing. The 1Ds give you the ability to do more than three shots. In fact, you can take up to seven bracketed shots with these cameras. You can pick how many shots you want to bracket. It's a custom function. Just dial it in. With two shots, you got the ability to tell it whether you want the first shot to be overexposed or the first shot to be underexposed by uh, selecting your bracketing order, which is the next custom function over. You can Program in the minimum and maximum shutter speeds you want to work with. You can lock in a single shutter speed with a 1D Mark IV and a single aperture as well so that the camera would never change the shutter speed or the aperture no matter what you did to it. Now granted, you can go right back into the custom functions and disable that so it's back to normal. But if you're working in situations where the light's not changing and you want to ensure that, hey, no matter what I do, I'm not going to turn a dial and change my shutter speed or my aperture, it gives you the ability to do it. Then there's one other one, and that is apply shooting and metering mode. And this lets you, this is kind of neat, because it lets you preset an exposure mode, a metering setting, and on your exposure mode, you're starting shutter speeds and lens openings. And then you can jump back to them at any time by just pressing a button. So you can be shooting, for instance, in the manual mode, shooting something in sunlight, and then if it suddenly moves into shade, you can just hit a button and have the camera instantly jump into aperture priority. And you can tell it, hey, do the aperture priority with the lens wide open, or do it with the lens at f22, or whatever you want. It's a cool feature. And you do it just by pressing the AE lock button once you've activated it. So, the bottom line. There's a lot to remember with these. Nobody uses every custom function. I said that before, I say it again. The point isn't to memorize everything you have in your camera, but if there are functions that you haven't used yet, you haven't explored, it's a great way to start to learn what the camera can do, just to start experimenting with them. And really, no matter what type of photography you like doing, whether you're a candid shooter, whether you like to work in the studio, uh, whether you shoot nature work, whether you're a sports photographer, really no matter what you like to do and no matter what camera you use, there's no question that you can get more out of your camera by working with some of these different custom, custom functions and applying them to your preferences, your situations, and your comfort zone. So that's our presentation for today. I want to once again thank you folks for coming in. Uh, this has really been great and certainly I'll be here to answer any questions that you may have, specific questions or more general type questions about the material that we covered during the day today. Thank you very much.